Uh, this is Jameson. I, uh, I feel like I need a an intro, like, hello, honey bunnies, kind of like um, Susan McGarry, but I'll figure that out at some point. I thought I would walk you through making one of these earth projects. So this is a mold that I bought at Slumpy's, and I have only, uh, truth be told, I've only made one of these, but I really liked the way it turned out, so I'm going to try to recreate it. Uh, I've actually tried to recreate it a couple of times, and I haven't been thrilled with my uh, glass choices after that first one, so I'm going back and trying to um, figure out what I did the first time, which is a little hard because I've since sold that piece, so now I'm trying to recreate this from memory. So what I'm doing here is this is a, a casting mold, and it's been sprayed with zip, and uh, it's a relief of the earth, which is because it's a relief mold here or, or a casting mold, it's in reverse. But you can kind of see this would be uh, North America here uh, with a little Florida hanging here and Central America, South America, and Europe over here. I have decided to cast one of these, and I think what I may do ultimately is drill out a hole in it and turn it into a clock. So we'll see if that works. But in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and, and try to piece this thing together. There is not a schedule for this or any instructions for this that came from the manufacturer. So what I have found is there's a color de Verre mold that's a cabbage leaf mold. And that cabbage leaf mold looks a lot like this in terms of size, in terms of fill weight. And I do remember the first time that I did this, I kind of roughly followed their firing schedule and it worked pretty well. So that's what I'm going to do here. So I need to hit about 350 grams of glass in here to, to get the results that I got the first time. And again, kind of similar to that cabbage leaf, I think they call for more in theirs. And it's not an exact um, match in terms of the size of the mold and stuff. So I think what works for me is about 350 grams. I've got a digital scale here. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Digital scale, I've got a little, um, uh, just an empty, container that serves as a riser so I can actually read the number and I know that the uh, mold itself and my little riser equal about 970 grams so if I add 350 to this and do the math right that's 1320 grams so if I'm going to start to fill this and I'll weigh it back and forth a little bit just to make sure that I'm kind of getting to that 350 grams of, of fill weight so I've got a variety of colors here that I've selected to uh, fill this. We'll see how it turns out. I am trying in this particular case to be a little true to the uh, topography here, and I've got some darker colors to represent the mountain ranges. What you'll see is I'll use some different tools to kind of lay in my frit. I've got mostly fine frit, with the exception of some medium for the mountains. Give me a little bit of uh, a little chunkier uh, pieces here. I do have some turquoise blue powder, and that's simply because I just had it in powder form. I didn't have it in fine frit, but everything else is in fine frit. And I'm using a variety of tools to, to fill this thing. This is a good old-fashioned straw, drinking straw, that's been uh, cut with a little notch in it, but it does actually help with scooping things out, so I may use this. Uh, uh, you know, recycling. This makes this no longer a single-use plastic. I've been using it in my studio here for a year. I've got these great uh, scoop tweezers. If you've got these, if you um, don't, they sell them on Amazon. I think there was a listing I saw where you can get two, two of them for about seven bucks in the United States. So uh, I, I just like these. I like to be able to scoop the frit with them. I like to be able to position with them. Great tool. Just a little paintbrush as I get outside the lines of my continents here, I may you know just sweep that back in. I've got a spoon to help scoop some frit. When I do the powder, I have a sifter here. And this is one of my favorite tools, and I know you've seen people, maybe myself included in another video, using this before. This is a, um, a cake decorating tool called a Sugar Rider from the Wilton Company, Wilton Sugar Rider. It's got a little button on it that vibrates this little uh, tip nozzle in the end here, and it works really well with um, powder and with fine frit. And this, I'll probably, you'll see me using this the most because it gives me a lot of control, particularly in this where I'm trying to uh, control to some extent where the frit lands. So uh, there you go. I'm going to get started here and uh, we'll see how this turns out. Oh, 
Okay, so you were probably watching me fill that up, wondering what the heck I was doing, but I really was just trying to follow some of the um, topography. I decided that I kind of layered the blue. I wanted the lightest turquoise around the coasts, and then I went a little bit darker, um, and then I kind of layered in the powder to make kind of a thicker, hopefully darker look in the ocean. We'll see how it turns out. So let's see, I gotta hit 1320 in grams, and you can't see it, but I can see on my scale that I'm right at 1100. So now it's time to add clear, and what I'm gonna do is just uh, gently add clear, trying not to, not that this was a fine design necessarily, but I'm just gonna try to not interrupt that too much. And I'm kind of watching the scale as I, it's a little piece of, I don't know what, cardboard or something. Anyway, I'm just trying to watch the scale kind of as I fill this up. I have another large um, thing of frit here. I'm going to have to crack into that. I, I keep thinking, I mean, I guess I could make my own frit. I've got a bunch of scrap tecta, so it would be nice to use some of that um, scrap to fill this, but I guess I feel like frit gives me a nicer finish than if I were to use chunks of broken up tecta back here um, on the back for volume. Not opposed to trying that in the future and playing around with it, but for the purposes of this, uh, frit's what I used the first time. That works. I suppose if I had medium or coarse, I could use that, but you know what? I don't. This is what I have to happen to have handy. Okay, so that's exactly 1250. I'll keep this guy for something else in the future. I'm sure I can reuse that. Fortunately, I have another large um, five pounder here ready to go. So now I need to add about 100 grams yet. So I'm just going to keep going. While I do this, I would ask for you to follow me on YouTube. I try to post some videos. Um, here's the thing. I'm not an instructor, and uh, I don't pretend to be. I'm certainly not an expert. Uh, what I consider is that I'm learning, and I'm inviting you to learn along with me, and hopefully these things turn out, and maybe it inspires some ideas, but, um, you know, I feel like as glass artists, particularly kind of starting out, we're all in this together, and if I can kind of record what's going on, um, I'm happy to happy to share. These are not professional quality, but follow me on YouTube and um, you'll see what other kind of shenanigans I get into. All right, I went just a little bit over 1323. Now this is uneven, so I'm going to try to level it out just a little bit, uh, knock it around a little bit, and then we're going to put it in the kiln with a firing schedule and we'll see what it looks like. Okay, so here it is out of the kiln. Um, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with this. You can see the colors really well and uh, the texture is nice in the relief there. Um, so I think, I mean, uh, the color's nice. There's certainly some adjustments I think I would make. So a few, a few thoughts on color. I had used a, um, this uh, is Sienna Frit to get, Sienna color, this is all bullseye, Sienna to get the darker mountain ranges. I think that worked out really well. I picked this, um, transparent fine tan to try to give a little bit of um, color then beyond just brown and green but give a little tan and that kind of gets lost so I think I would need to apply that maybe a little heavier. Um, across the board I think I could apply the color heavier even in the green it's kind of showing through a little bit. Where maybe I'm most disappointed is um, these kind of coastline areas where I used light aquamarine blue it just, it just vanishes. There's just not, I mean, there's a little color to it that you can see, but it's not maybe as much as I might want. This is the areas where I did the powdered frit, the turquoise blue. That you can see better. It really does stand out nicely. So, although I don't know that I like it as powder because then it doesn't kind of dissolve in as well as um, the, the rest of the fine frit. So as I go back to the store, I'm going to... Um, perhaps look for some blues that might look a little or might work a little bit better to give me a little bit of a darker look. Uh, I'm also going to look for um, yeah, uh, some blues that, that give me that darker effect and then uh, and particularly uh, medium frit on this. I, I paused there because I was thinking there's um, 
it's kind of hard to see here, but there's a little bit of a divot right off of uh, Baja, California, if you will. Uh, and even another one kind of right in the middle here. And what's funny, I mean, I don't see anything on the mold, but I very specifically remember from the first one that I fired, I had big spots there too. Um, in fact, one of them I would call an all-out bubble. It just didn't happen to, to pop on me. So that I've got a little area in these mold, this mold. This firing schedule worked, and this amount of glass seemed to work. So uh, I measured it, and just, you know, on average around um, most of this and kind of these ocean areas, it averages between five and a half and six and a half millimeters, mostly six, really. So that fill weight of 350 worked pretty well. It is in some of these thickest parts here where there are, there are mountains, so to speak. It does come up to be about eight, eight and a half in some areas. I only annealed this for an hour, so I probably need to be thinking about that and anneal this. Um, maybe I'll put it back in, or when I do a slump or something, I'll just be extra careful and then anneal it then. Nah, I might just... That I have to do some research on. This is where I said I'm not a teacher. I'm, a, I'm learning with you. I'm not sure if that's the greatest idea, so maybe don't follow that advice. But I, I'm thinking that if for some of this thicker area, it might be just a little bit under annealed. The other thing that I would like to do um, or, or give some consideration to in the future is that <clears throat> it really does, like in the case of this video, you're seeing these colors nice and bright because I've got a white background behind it. But when you just um, when you just look at it straight on without much of a background behind it, you you really lose some of that color. So I also wonder if I couldn't supplement some of that clear frit that I did with a little bit of opaque um, white or something. I don't know, you also have to be careful to make sure that you don't pick a frit that's gonna have a reaction, uh, you know, colors with, with something like dense white, for instance, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use if, if it's got a reaction. But anyway, I'm gonna think about that a little bit more. Um, I'm not sure, I, I, I guess I could cut a circle blank that's just white and fuse this right down onto there, but with some of this texture, I'd be worried about bubbles, so that I'd have to give some consideration to that too. Not sure exactly what I'm gonna do with this piece yet. Uh, stay tuned. Okay, so let's see, a day or two has passed and I've had some time to think and reflect about this project and what I wanna do with it next. And um, I'm still, I, ultimately I want to do a couple of different things with these perhaps. I might wanna turn it into a bowl. Um, I have another idea for something that, you know, could just be a wall hanging or something as well. So if that's the case though, I really want this, color to pop a little bit more and of course if you're going to put it behind if you're going to put it on a wall where the background color is a light color then it would probably pop anyway but i mean you can see it kind of on this black here which not a lot of people have black walls so this might be a bad example but there's that and then there's this you just see it so much better when it's on white and what I've decided in my head is I really like the transparency of the colors, but I want to be able to create almost some sort of background back here. And I think for a future version of this, one of the things I'm going to try, I don't know if it's going to work, but is to use some uh, translucent white um, opalescent, which will give me that, um, allow light through, but, but um, you know, still have more of a white um, tone to it. So um, I would layer with clear and then put a layer of this on top and we'll see what happens there. But that's not what this video is for. What this video is for is to now take uh, what's a pretty good piece and potentially ruin it. So <laughs> we'll see what the uh, what happens here and, and I'm inviting you along to learn with me. My thought, my brainstorm was what if I, now that this is solid and fired, what if I put it back in the mold which is easy to do and, and to get it lined up easy because this is a very defined and specific mold. So I can pop that right back in where it came from uh, and refire it. And rather than add a lot of thickness through glass, what if I refired it with mica on the back? And one of the uh, fused glass groups that I belong to on Facebook, uh, one for which I will share this video, is kind of featuring mica for the month of January. And that's what got my, my mind working. So I think that's what I'm going to do today. So my thought is um, to, I want the a mica to adhere a little bit as I do this. And so you, sometimes you use a like a stamping um, pad or something if you're gonna do uh, mica stamping. What I'm gonna try, we'll see if it works, is just spray this thing down with good old fashioned white rain to make it sticky. Then I'm gonna 
put mica on the back and then um, drop it right into the mold and fire it. And I do want to put it back in the mold because I don't want to lose all this texture. So if I fired it up face down like that, then it would slump back because I have to take it to a full fuse to get the mica to stick to it and I don't want to lose all that texture on the front. So what kind of mica am I going to use? I have this cheapy bottle called Pearl X from Jacquard. Clearly, I bought this at a national uh, hobby store uh, at 40% off, so it was less than this. This duo blue-green, this is a gorgeous color and would be a really cool color uh, for even this earth background. However, this particular mica product that I bought at this store, um, as a matter of fact, I found it in their glass hobby aisle. It was with the polymer clays, I think, or something right behind the glass or right across the aisle. And it caught my eye. There were some other colors too. And I thought, you know, as cheap as that can be, I'm going to buy it and just try it. And so I have tried it before and you lose all of this blue color. So this gorgeous blue color is not uh, what fires when it comes out of the kiln. But I have some other micas. And so one day I was just messing around and made myself a little sample um, sheet of or a little sample piece of mica. I have some kind of brass mica, and I wanted to see what it would look like uncapped and then capped, and um, there's all kinds of stories. There's some irid in here that I was playing with, too, so there's all sorts of stories to this, but uh, what I did was I used that brass mica. I have this uh, kind of silver white mica, and then I had some of this blue powder, and I fired them all at a full fuse to see kind of what would happen, and I use that now as my tester. So I'm not sure with this light if you can see this very well. While you lose all the blue color, it's, it does have a hint of this kind of bluey green, but really it comes across almost as almost yellowy silver. Boy, I don't know. My, I'm not coming up with my words. Bottom line is, though, it actually fires to still a, a pretty decent color, and I think it could look neat on the back of this. And it's inexpensive, so I'm going to use that since I'm going to use a lot of it today to get good coverage on this thing. Um, and then we'll see what happens. Um, so again, I'm not a teacher, but I'm a learner, and I'm inviting you to learn along with me. So now, because I'm dealing with mica, I'm definitely going to mask up and uh, follow along here as I spray this thing with hairspray and then get mica on it, and we'll get it over to the kiln. All right, so it's out of the kiln, and uh, this is a disappointing uh, disappointing visual here, a very large bubble, and there's another medium one that formed in the middle that you can kind of see there. But it's that large one that's going to kind of throw this whole project off. Um, so I need to let this cool off a little bit. It's still too warm. <clears throat> and then I'm going to rinse the mica off and see if... You know, I can still tell whether or not the mica gave me the effect that I wanted. Um, and I mentioned in the last segment that this darn mold has given me some issues, and so here we are again. I'm wondering how exactly it happened. Um, <laughs> as I said earlier, I'm learning and I'm bringing you all along on the learning journey with me, and now i got to figure out how to fix this. So, okay, I washed it up. And uh, it's, it's really a shame that the entire uh, Pacific Ocean here has cratered in. Can you see how big that bubble is? Because the back is really cool. So I did get, uh, you know, I'm learning and I've learned a lot in doing this piece. Um, the mica truly gave me a really cool effect back here. I mean, you can see all that shimmer in the light there. I'm going to try to bring it back up. Maybe I'll turn this light off and see if that gives you, I mean, just, just awesome color. And uh, you can see that color through this piece as well, which is what I was hoping. You, In those areas around the coasts where I was complaining about the frit being lighter, that's where you see it the best. And it's just, it's really cool. So now I got to figure out how to fix this and see if I can salvage it. I guess my current thinking, I mean, all this texture of the landscape on here, I don't, I don't want to lose that. So I wouldn't, wouldn't fire it face down. I guess I'm wondering what will happen if I put it on a kiln shelf, as is, and uh, fire it to get it to, to lay flat. Would that, you know, bubble 
disappear. I think this distortion is just going to be there, so that's not going to fix itself. Um, but what happens to the coast here? And I've got this little divot here. I'm less concerned about that one, although if it went to a full to a full fuse, it would probably probably take care of that. So I got to figure out what schedule would I use to put this back in now and see if I could get that to flatten out. And when I do, what, what kind of effect do I get? What does that end up looking like? So the learning continues. I don't know if I should keep this video going or not. Maybe I'll film one more segment once I've fired it and see what it looks like. Um, and you guys can see kind of how I attempted to fix that. But there you go. That's where we stand so far. Um, mica, cool effect, would be inclined to try that again. I don't think that I would have great results if I, although I'm going to do some testing and I'm not going to do a testing in a full on mold like this anymore. I'll do some sample, um, so just some sample pieces. <clears throat> what I'm thinking is if I, if I put frit uh, down and then cover it with the clear or, you know, get to the fill weight with the clear and then dusted the mica over the clear, I just don't think I'm going to get quite this effect. I think it's going to fall down. It's going to get into my stuff. It might pop up in here. I don't know if it'll fire quite right. Now it could end up being beautiful, so I'll still try it. But um, I'm resistant to even think about trying to put this thing back in its mold and refire it like I did last night to get this effect. Uh, so that's disappointing. We'll see. I'm rambling at this point. That's it. Thanks. Okay, so I put this back in the kiln. I took it up to, 50, uh, let's see, 1250, I believe. I think I held that for about 20 or 30 minutes and got this to flatten back out. It's still not perfect. You can still see, you know, quite a lot of <laughs> uh, residual bubbleage damage there. Um, but it, you know, generally got flat again. Um, now I have this bulge that is unfortunate. So. Uh, you know, in the end, I've learned a lot doing this piece. I've actually got another globe in the oven right now. Um, I guess what this taught me was, um, you know, just thinking about my firing schedule, knowing your mold. Um, uh, you know, I learned some new techniques. I still think I'm going to try this mica stuff in the future again. It's just the mold, unfortunately, made that bubble. Uh, I might consider firing schedules a little bit more closely. But anyway, anyway I'm uh, just kind of going along on this journey. Uh, if you'd like to continue to, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I'll probably turn it into a bowl or something, but this video is long enough as it is. So I'm going to end this one. But if you'd like to, you know, kind of continue learning glass with me as I do it, please subscribe to my channel. And uh, uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.